<laughs> well, we got uh, we have a quorum at four o'clock. So. Well, if you okay. I'm going to announce that the meeting's being recorded um, visually and auditorily, uh, and a public comment period. Anybody from our wide-ranging public out here? No, you told them you could have something. I, I did. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I was uh, I was distracted. No, it's okay. I almost missed my chance. <laughs> Um, as a follow-up to the uh, to the effort to get municipal departments to sign on with the ICC to vote on the new energy efficiency code, uh, there is now another effort statewide to get municipal officials to uh, write letters and submit testimony to the BBRS to ask them to create a net zero stretch code. Now that the stretch code is, uh, now that the regular code is caught up to the stretch code, um, and they're going to need a lot of convincing because they're not really uh, geared in that direction. So, um, so I'm hoping that you all might be interested in submitting a letter uh, and potentially attending the hearing uh, in Boston on May 7th. Um, I'm planning to go, and if uh, if there were. If, if, there, if, if any of you had uh, the desire to uh, have somebody else read your testimony, I would be happy to do that, or you're more than welcome to attend yourself. I have a sample uh, sort of template letter that's being circulated if you're, if for those who might be interested. But I hope that um, this commission would consider uh, submitting a letter at the very least and potentially testimony to the hearing <coughs> in favor of the BBRS uh, creating a net zero stretch code. There is a bill in the legislature um, co-sponsored by uh, Joe Comerford and Representative Gouveia um, at, uh, requiring the BBRS to create a net zero stretch code. I don't know how far that bill is going to get, but that is another avenue <coughs> to pursue and is being pursued. Are there any questions? I'm happy to respond. Questions or comments? Yeah, um, Adele, if you could send the template on to us, that would be great. You actually sent to Chris and distribute it to us. I would be happy to do that. When you say um, the BBR is creating a, a net zero stretch code, then the code would be automatically updated to that to basically replace the current stretch code? Is that the assumption? Yeah. Long shot. Uh -huh. I mean, just uh, as a response to the note, uh, so to say, I mean, it may be that what happens is that what gets propounded is a is a path to a net zero stretch code. A what? A path to a net zero stretch code. Path. Uh huh. So it may be something that you know tightens up the stretch code, and then but it doesn't quite get to net zero till at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. you know, that might be a way to go as well. Um, any other public comments? Okay. Um, I would take a motion to approve the minutes from March 14th meeting. So moved. Bill moved. Actually seconded. Any comments or all in favor? I think that was unanimous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So. Uh, um, actually, I'm going to jump to a few shorter articles here. I'm going to uh, just an update on the voting of the IECC. I think everybody knows that we have. Oh, hang on, let me find my right piece of paper here. I think everybody knows. Everybody should know because it's in the minutes that we have um, six departments in, in Northampton have signed on. So we'll have 24 votes um, come September. Um, um, just going to read something that came in from MAPC. Throughout 2018, we worked hard to build an awareness uh, about the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code and hoped that Massachusetts municipalities would engage with us on this important effort. We anticipated that about 400 voters nationwide could be the tipping point for cities and towns to have a pro-efficiency impact on the IECC. 
instead of just 400 nationwide, there is now the potential for up to at least 420 voters within Massachusetts. So just to let you guys know, you're not alone. We are blown away by our efforts, as over 35 municipalities from the Commonwealth have registered to participate in this national movement. Massachusetts cities and towns will play a big part in decarbonizing and improving our buildings now and into the future. Thanks to all those who registered for taking this hugely important step. And um, you guys can, anybody wants to, can add an email uh, you know, in order to get updates and stuff from MAPC on how this goes. But I thought everybody should know that it's, um, the efforts hopefully will pay off in September. And uh, it's been pretty successful. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so something else that just came in, this is kind of uh, last minute, but I brought this before the commission in the past, um, what it was called Rent Rocket. Um, and Northampton was working with Burlington and Boston, I don't know who else was actually involved in it at that time. You know, the idea was to come up with a, an online listing for rental units that uh, at first it was supposed to be an online listing that would show an energy score of some kind for each energy, you know, rent rental unit. Um, and as we went through the process a couple of years ago, um, using a grant from through the U.S. Urban Sustainable Directors Network, um, the idea shifted to one where it was more of um, of a site that would show the group, so kind of green listings, so it would show green features. Um, of, of, uh, the, uh, of an apartment of some kind of a uh, rental house. Um, and then the grant ran out, it wasn't quite done, and it went off into the ether someplace, and it has re-arisen. Someone has continued to work on it, um, and re re renamed now as Rent Lab, and has kind of brought it far, pretty far along, um, to the point where they're looking for input. Um, so I did send out an email with um, their query, uh, and um, what they call elements of the smart living score. So L you know, a, kind of a heavy text two-pager on elements of what can we go into a smart living score. And they wanted feedback, um, basically to the overall components of the score um, and how much their weight, uh, weight makes sense. Is there anything missing? Um, um, they're trying to focus on publicly available data in the initial version. Um, uh, and basically just general feedback. And then uh, for myself, I, I said, uh, I added to the question that I would bring here. So, you know, I would say let's take some time to look at this and, and if anybody has feedback, I could bring that to them. I've all already provided my own feedback to them. But the other thing I'd want to say is, um, you know, would this be a tool that we could somehow see being used in Northampton or Western Mass? And if so, how might we do that? And I'm just looking for ideas. Um, uh, this has been uh, before the commission in the past, and so I've got some past information from you guys, but uh, probably just open it up for discussion. So I've got it um, on the screen there. You can see if you. Oops. I want this. Maybe I'm not going to show it. Anyhow, you can see you can you, when you get to the rent lab screen, you can you can zoom in and get to a a web page that shows you all the different buildings with uh, different smart living scores from the lowest utility cost utility cost okay to the highest utility cost, and then we the missing details. Um, so we'll take a look at. Um, and then there's a dashboard you can zoom in on. And you can see the kind of different features that are listed in this Elements of Smart Living. Um, so I'm going to just kind of take one at a time here and just ask for that. So the first one they have listed is access to active transportation. They describe it, the source data is a walk score, bike score, transit score, API. I looked that up, and it seems to be a, a, an online score of each community. Wayne, you know more about this? I mean, oh, yeah, it's a great system. You can do walk score. It gives you, it's, you know, it's not perfect, but it gives you good data. 
Okay. So the API means they send a direct feed to it. So you go to their site, and their site's grabbing it from the walk source. Okay, from the walk source site. And then they're suggesting a calculation based on the 100 point score that that offers. Just divide by 33 so you can get a zero to three point um, uh, score to be added on to here. And they say 100 point score from the walk score. I'm, I'm, when you, are you, why would you just limit it to walk? Or is that basically just a misnomer? I think it's just the data is out there. So the walk score is what are like North Ham, downtown North Hampton is like a 98 walk score because you get all your needs met in a short time. Okay. And you know, way out in Turkey Hill Road is going to have a really low walk score. It's a great place to live, but you're not going to walk anywhere. Okay. And they don't have the same. They don't have something similar for bike or transit. Not that I'm aware. Of. AARP has a similar thing. That's a livability score, and the, and it's a little bit broader. So I don't know exactly what it has. But the walk score is not about walking infrastructure. Okay. It's about what stuff is close to you. So that's at least my understanding. So you could have every need you have in life within a hundred feet, and you get a really high walk score. But it might be. A really dangerous place to walk. It's something they have the data for. They, they aspirationally want it. I don't think they have it. Okay. Um, if Northampton was to implement something like this, uh, and they allowed us to fine tune it, is this something that we could fine tune for Northampton to provide our own data? You know, something that would be more walk score, bike score, transit score based. I'm not a techie, so I'm not the right person to okay. ask. I mean, we could find a lot better data, but whether we can actually integrate it in the score or not, I just don't know enough about okay. that. Okay. I, I feel like some of the um, real estate w websites already integrate this, like Zillow or Trulia uh, or whatever. Like, if you could look up a listing in your hand, it gives you a walkability score. Or Great. Thing. Okay. I have mixed feelings. I mean, I, I think it's great. Having the data out there is wonderful, so I, I have no negative feelings. You know, when they started this ramp rocket, it was about filling that missing piece that we keep talking about, the disconnect between landlords who don't have incentive to make their place more energy efficient, and so renters, you know, don't know one place really well, so one place is poorly decided, but they don't know what that is. So the original idea was to help provide that information. As it gets more ambitious, it's a more complete story, so maybe that's good, but you're right, it's competing with other things that are out there already. Um, which I don't mind having extra data as long as we're not losing that original core thing, which we're so exciting about. Yeah, so I was, um, one thing that I, I asked them already, <coughs> I haven't gotten a response back, is could this be a tool that different rental listing agencies could use? Could they add this to their site? You know, something like that. Um, so that it's not in competition with. Their financial model is it's in competition with. Did you actually find your rental? Right I what's that? Did you, so their what their financial model is they're getting a cut of rents. I do not know. Okay. I don't know what they're no. And so that was a question I asked them. I haven't got a response back um, because the last time this came up with the Energy Commission was that some rental agencies might see this as competition, and you know, so the last thing we need to do is is try to go out in competition with some of the local businesses. Um, so, but if they could see it as an added value <coughs> to, to their site, that might be, but I don't know. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm kind of cynical of this all in one, like all these data points in one place. And they're making a lot of assumptions. We've been through this with, a, with the several different tech services and programs we've, we've seen. There's like a nice shiny UI, you know, you can, you can user experience, and it looks pretty. But so much things are based on assumptions or like very, um, wide angle data analysis, like nothing really specific. Not to mention that this thing, they're relying on people self-reporting energy bills. So it's gonna be very select specific um, participants. It's, it's one thing if this is, if they're trying to evolve this to be a platform for a disclosure law that says everyone has to report energy bills you know, annually, or anytime property sold, you have to report energy bills, or every landlord has to report um, you know, then it's like, okay, we need a platform to do that so people can log on and see it. But for just volunteering, it just, it's this somewhat frustrating because it's like, this stuff is totally needed, right? We need more awareness, but it's so just 
so many assumptions built into it that I don't think it's really useful, and I really don't think it's people are going to love it and use it. And that's what you need. You need the traffic. You need people to voluntarily report. You need you need the marketing, the advertising for it to be viable. So you need eyeballs on it, right? You need people to use it. And unless it's actual hard data, if there's some magic analysis where they're saying, you know, I mean, it's the same thing with energy efficiency stuff, right? It's like you, the drive-by infrared images have so many errors, so many flaws, and you can't actually say this is what's going on in your house. You can use that as an engagement tool to take the conversation on the next level, but this seems like, you know, they're trying to use this as like very specific information to get a score, which is based on a lot of different detail and specific information. That's my thing. I'm, I'm cynical, but I also think there's a need for it as a platform for something very forward-thinking like a disclosure law, which I think is fantastic. Would you, would you, um, unless someone else is going to jump in there, I, would you feel different if, if it was based on, you know, hard data, not so much energy use, because that takes into um, order occupancy, order of behavior issues, but if it was based on um, this building has, you know, so much insulation in the roof, so much insulation in the, in the basement. You can't do that from. Uh, how are you going to do it that? It would have to be reported. I mean, it would. It would yeah. Again, and with the again with the idea that the people who are going to report it are going to be the folks who have well insulated buildings. Right. If you don't have a well insulated building, you're not going to report. You're not going to want to be up there. Yeah, no one's going to report. People still don't pick, and or no, it's still this like. It would right. If it was done in Northampton, there would have to be some kind of an effort. Put in yeah, for a requirement. For a requirement. I would. I would say that as a landlord, I would love for potential renters to know that my buildings were energy efficient, but unless there's a way that they're going to get the eyeballs of all of the people looking for apartments, then it becomes of no value. Uh, they would have to link it into something like Zillow or Craigslist where everyone is finding apartments, because if they're not, if there isn't a way to get people to look at it, then what value is it? I think the, the, I think the critical point is to what, what Aiden said <coughs> was about a requirement in creating a law, which I'm not sure, I don't even know where we begin with that, um, in order to actually get fair, comprehensive, hard data that doesn't rely on self-reporting or self-promoting for that matter. Um, I mean, you, part of the appeal of this originally was to, as Wayne said, was to incentivize uh, building owners, but there's no threat to them with this what so far. I mean, I mean, we don't, we have, we don't have enough rental units as it is, so it's not like that there's a, a stiff competition for that, and plus our rental rates are so high, so. And I, so we would have to, I think in order, but I, I do think that if, if we, there were requirements and the city had the city's imprimatur when, when uh, uh, as a, you know, a, a go-to scoring system, if I'm renting an apartment or I'm a landlord and uh, the, this is a municipal government analysis of, of these properties, it would have, it, bear more weight, I would think, it would have more credence than um, a program that's got other agendas, I would imagine, at some level, or at least agendas that we're not clear on. Uh, the municipal agendas would be pretty evident because the idea is to promote um, more efficiency, uh, better, better living systems and rental properties. So. I'm not sure where this goes for, I'm not sure what this, I, I share uh, Aiden's skepticism about this on some level in that Aiden, I don't know how we can make this useful. This is part of the discussion we've been having Off and on. for years, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And this is the frustration right. point that we hit is how do we mass our data so that it's fair and accurate and and has relevance? That's the tip, that's the toughest point. Is and, go ahead. I was say, is there no way to have mandatory disclosure laws? I bet that's the I don't point. know. City's doing that. But. I mean, to some degree, probably, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I imagine there are some parameters on which you can require information, and Louis would know this better than I, 
um, you know, I, I, I think there would be an understandable uh, libertarian resistance to something like that, but, and I don't know if there are already state laws that preclude municipalities requiring certain data. It's also privacy issues too that we come run into, so. But I don't think it's impossible. I'm not ruling it out. I just don't know what it looks like. I yeah. have no idea what it would be. It, it, it is possible Boston's done it, New York's done it. But of course, Boston's it. constitution predates the U.S. Gotcha. and mass constitution. <laughs> they can do whatever the hell they want. Right. <laughs> yet, I don't think that's what allowed them to do it. Um, <laughs> but I think that they did it for very large, you know, very large, large systems. Large yeah. systems, right. So you know, the data reporting can get onerous for someone small. Right. Um, uh, and it gets, gets more invasive as the smaller it gets too. So, I mean, there is really? stuff that Louis really does and that already is data sets. So. Well, I think new, you know, newer new construction is pretty pretty straightforward and pretty simple, and it's been recorded and reported for since what 2010. Um, that's not hard. At the older stuff, I'd ask who who here knows how much insulation they have in their roof. Well, I do. <laughs> but representative only because I mean we're we're a focused group of right. people right. you know I mean we're and and if I I couldn't have told you how much insulation was in the roof of the house that I lived in last because it, I didn't put it in myself you know or have or cause it to be put in myself so you know I think it would be difficult especially when you get into um, you know that blue house out there on the, you know the on the, on uh, what is that Old South Street? I, it, people wouldn't necessarily know. Um, so we would get on self-reporting accurate accurately self-reported basis, we'd get a really skewed set of numbers. I think. Right. So what I'm hearing, um, uh, and it's interesting that we have we we dove right into the energy aspects. <laughs> um, um, but I'm hearing general, general sense that self-reported data wouldn't be viable. It just it would have too much uncertainty to it. Um, unless it's a requirement. So if you say unless it's a if you don't, if you don't report, that. and your unit's going to be a default, you know, the the mean, the worst, or the mean average of the housing types in that age bracket, which is bad. But if you do report, you have an opportunity to differentiate yourself. So is there any way to have it not be self-reported? To have it have to go through some kind it's of it's like a green button. We need utilities to allow their data to be shared. So if you could um, say, "I'm okay with my utility information being shared for my to my municipality," you know, not to private companies or to my municipality, then automatically that could go in a database. Your actual utility bills, you know, Columbia Gas, National Grid, per unit per meter. So it gets simple as that, and then it's just there. But <coughs> There's, that's been a long battle that utilities until they they actually go bankrupt, which is probably 20 years from now. You know, when their business models are really failing, um, they'll innovate and they'll do all sorts of things like that. Yeah, and you would also have to get that authorization from the actual uh, person on the utility bill. So every single time that rental unit turns over, you're going to have to get a reauthorization from that new person. Mm -hmm. To the utility company, uh, it, it, but the yes. concept of the green button is that that can be as simple as press a button and you give that authorization. You know, it's like how do you just make it really simple? So let's say you're calling in for your you're new, moving to a new apartment, you're signing for a new account. Okay, you know, here's all the information. I'm going to email you the green button initiative from your city or something, and then you basically just. Uh, the idea is make it as simple as possible. Yeah, I've done it for housing authorities, and we can't, when it when it comes to uh, tenant paid utilities, it becomes an impossible chore to get signatures from everyone. I've never encountered a utility company where there was a simple click of a button. Every single one that I've dealt with has been, you have to actually get that individual person to sign off mm -hmm. on a document getting that release. Yeah. I don't know if this is relevant, but I just finished up working for years with capital asset management and maintenance for the state, and I saw them through, leap through a lot of hoops in trying to conceptualize what they were doing, uh, efficiency, and 
what I saw that they were able to do that made some sense, it became consensual English and usable data, was when they recorded the steps that had been made to improve a building or facility. And they could say tangibly what the intervention was for improvement. That was useful data. The other stuff was for the most part pie in the sky aggregations with no, no real usefulness. So, um, and they, pre they then projected based on the improvements some kind of a, they got a conclusion out of a building that had had X, Y, Z windows, insulation, doors, high efficiency, uh, HVAC equipment. That was, and what, what could they do with that? I mean, well, they, they were doing very significant, uh, where's the allocation of resource for improvement in energy efficiency in uh, what 5,000 structures mm -hmm. the, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has. And, and one of the, <coughs> the most difficult in the Commonwealth is, is Springfield Technical Community College. Um, that's an absolute energy sieve going on down there. They've been, been working hard to get that under the control. But what, what is really useful is that data on what's the intervention to improve, you know, if you get the analysis of, of uh, what the problems are with the building and then what you've done to improve it, that was useful data. So by useful data, is it actually boiling that down to an energy savings number? Or is it basically a list that says this building has new windows, you know, weather stripping has all been updated, there's been improved insulation in the attic, just that list itself. Is that, I mean? Yeah, and I, I wonder how good they were in terms of measures before and after on, you know, uh, energy consumption and others. I don't know that, but it's, uh, it's certainly been a, a useful experience in the Commonwealth of, you know, sort of large systems analysis. and. Um, and on the whole, the Commonwealth has done certainly better than most states in trying to produce, promote uh, improvements. At the risk of sounding um, too dismissive of this organization, um, I think that using, kind of saying that this is in the interest of renters is a little bit disingenuous. If we want to mandate um, property owners to make improvements in energy efficiency, then we can do that. But I mean, as Bill said, we have such a um, shortage of rental housing, of renting rental stock in the city that people aren't going to be, you know, moved to look at what the rating is in terms of energy. They're just looking for something they can afford. They're looking for something they can bring their dog to. They're looking for, you know, a, a pet-friendly household or something like that. So, you know, if we're thinking about how to compel um, rental property owners, then we should do that. But I'm not sure that framing it as, you know, this rent lab, we're going to help the renters in the city, it just doesn't feel like the right tool to me. Yeah, my assumption is the opposite. I think property owners would feel threatened by this, by raising awareness of actual energy bills, where tenants, if you're going to rent apartments at $1,500 a month, and the average energy bill is 20% more than that, but that's significant. I just feel like generally people who rent out spaces in the city know that they can get the prices they want because there's such a um, tight market so I mean in theory I think that's true mm -hmm. but I just think in Northampton's current rental market it's not going to be effective mm -hmm. so it allow the more efficient units to charge at the higher end of the market but the other ones would have to be lower yeah. and what we need to be paying attention to and I don't think it has to be an either or situation but what we need to be paying attention to in this city is um, affordable housing, affordable yeah. rentals, not, you know, energy efficient as the main thing that we're looking at, because we just don't have enough rental, rentals available. And yet those two are highly related, because yeah. lower, lower utility costs is affordability. Mm -hmm. So high efficiency sure. is definitely tied with affordability. Yeah, they are, you're right, they're entwined for sure. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, to the point that the things that we're trying to incentivize are, are uh, landlords or building owners to in, 
improve their efficiency, but just as importantly, maybe even more so to some degree, is uh, retain some affordability and availability for our, 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 our rental stock has gone down substantially um, and to owner stock. And as a result, we, we uh, we're con the biggest concern, of course, is the ability to be able to afford to live in the city. So <clears throat> I think people, I don't know, it's not too smug, but I think people actually using this um, tool have would obviously have the flexibility to pick and choose and probably money wouldn't be too much of an object it, it's if, if if they're not concerned about the rental rates then they're looking at the energy efficiency rates and you're absolutely right chris they're they're correlated but that's not you know when you when you see something advertised they'll give you a range of what the rates are or you know if, if this were a big concern of a property owner they would just do uh uh, utilities included but the so for the most part people who are on fixed or low income uh, this doesn't this is not a tool that I think that they would go to first they're trying to find something that would meet their needs accessibility is I was going to say yeah. for fixed and low income people in yeah. the city right now the, but the, the growing crisis is how limited accessibility exactly. is and there's going to have to be some catch-up hopefully in in, um, in rental housing stock projected out from here i believe isn't the commonwealth trying to diminish again sort of uh, local control on some of the standards to, as a promotion so I, that's my understanding yes mm -hmm. that's my understanding yes and that, that and, and the That's thing is, be is no. we, we we don't have an accessibility scoring rating uh, for for oh. apartments and stuff. This I mean this has walkability. That's true yeah. and bikeability yeah. and stuff like that. But um, you know, are there elevators available? Are there is there parking available? Is there handicap parking? Is there uh, you know it, it, it's so there are all sorts of compelling issues that drive people when they're searching for yeah. some place to live and. This addresses one dimension of it, and not very well, as we we've discussed. So, well, we certainly been talking about the energy side of it. So yeah, you, you yeah. Did, you're also trying to cover, you know, unit size. So they give a higher grade for a smaller unit. Kind of counterintuitive for many <laughs> people's point of view, but <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> from I mean, an energy point of view, it's easier to heat a smaller from, unit, right? From a sustainability yeah. point of view, they're absolutely right. Correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they also give points for management of waste whether there's recycling on site, whether there's curbside, curbside recycling, et cetera, uh, whether there's composting available. Um, and they give, uh, actually, quite frankly, their system gives a lot of weight to uh, transparency. So the more information a landlord is willing to divulge, and from this discussion, it would have to be accurate information, somehow confirmed. Um, uh, they give a lot of points for the transparency, so you know you know, you've got someone who's, who's being transparent on what's available there. Actually, that's, they, that's a really important point, Chris, that to be able to confirm. They, I doubt yeah. they have staff that are going to go out and be able to check the veracity of the statements of any people who are, are self-reporting. Right, right. And that's, 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 I could see this being used pretty easily. By yeah. it, and we're just being rounded off to the benefit of the people that are reporting. Right. That's one reason why I kind of wonder, you know, if we if, if we use this, this is you know a framework, and we populate it with our own scoring systems. You know, could well, we could we do something that has local data that goes into it? Well, there's already so many scoring systems, and they're being developed. You know, DOE has one. And I haven't looked for an apartment recently. I guess I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, MLS not not listed yet. I mean, there's efforts to have like curves ratings on MLS for yep. most of the new construction. So if you have like three different scoring systems, it just it adds confusion. Right. You know, for us to make our own scoring system, that's a huge undertaking. <laughs> yeah, could be not. Yeah, so, could be. Okay, so is this something that the city would have to pay for? You know, I don't know how their, I don't know their business plan. Um, you know, this was grant funded work for a couple cycles. Uh, that a number of communities were interested in, particularly some communities with large college uh, uh, populations. 
Um, and then it kind of popped up again um, without really a description of any kind of business plan, uh, but just that it's been developed more with a request for feedback. So I thought I would see if I could get some feedback for them. I have one question about housing. Um, sorry, do you follow up to that? No. Um, kind of this idea of affordable housing. Like, I, I heard about some cities, maybe Seattle, changing zoning to really encourage infill in different ways, like small units and we, we, we've done that. I know we've done that yeah. recently, but they've gone so far as like there's incentivizing design companies to help people convert their you know attics and apartments, things like that. Um, is there another step where that would be practical? You know, so if we don't have we don't have a, a revenue source that would allow us to subsidize or, or incentivize with with that usually you mean when we talk about zoning, it's more, uh, we prefer to do more carrot than stick. But we don't have a whole lot of carrot to offer. They usually offsets like, you know, usually larger developments, you know, the mandatory green space that you're required to have, you can get a reduction in parking issues, you can get a reduction in revenue. We also just approved a host community fee for people that have more than two units doing right. Airbnb, so that's oh, to try right. and, you know, that there's enough stock in the city or we get compensated if there's not and that kind of thing. Oh, so, so the short-term rentals where it can impact the long-term rentals. And the short-term rental thing is actually in process now. We're dealing with that. Massachusetts finally made an allowance principally for taxing and, and mm -hmm. to limit and restrict large-scale short-term rental systems. But yeah, I mean, all the challenges, but zoning is pretty much the tool that we have yeah. for, for affordable housing. There's still lot size requirements, right? And there's still parking requirements. And I wonder if we're looking at that without. I think Northampton has some of the, the smallest square footage per dwelling unit requirements mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and parking reductions at, that of any local communities. I mean, you can build on a lot less in Northampton than you can in, in any of the other surrounding towns. Mm -hmm right now and, and that came in I think 2015 right. it was the big push to, for the reduction in sizes it would be hard to get it much tighter than that. things that people push back on the very most you know when all of a sudden somebody's creating some kind of infill right. space and then, and then you in start, their neighborhood yeah. or like so it's <coughs> challenging yeah. I mean, the, the projected mass ADU conversion thing never occurred, of course, when people were screaming about the possibility of it. But, but and in fact, actually, I don't know how much of our stock of accessory dwelling units have actually translated into more affordable systems. I don't know. Maybe Wayne has an idea, but I no, I mean, our guess is about a third. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. The there are additional things coming in, the planning board is considering um, allowing two families by right in urban or residential A. So there could be additional uh, things that, that will, will allow for more uh, density. So um, this seems a familiar conversation and maybe we should not belabor it more. I, I, will, um, I will say, people know of any listing agencies or online that has any kind of rating that goes with it, shoot me an email with a link to it. The realtors are very threatened by that. Right, but, but, but I'm hearing, but people have been realtor saying realtor that they're, they're out here, that there is already ones that are doing it. So if you, if you know of one, I could go out and look for them and try to find them myself, but if anybody knows mm -hmm. them, just shoot me an email. Rating yeah. systems? Yeah, yeah, I'm curious what's out there. Because, like I said, I haven't looked for an apartment in a long time. I'm actually a landlord. I'd like to know what's out there, perhaps. What are my tenants looking at? <laughs> um, uh, but for this, okay, thanks. Um, I will send this information back to them, not to be discouraging. But, uh, to them, but I will. <laughs> hey, they asked for feedback. Right? There you go. Give right. what you asked for. Exactly. So we're going to give feedback. Um, that just leaves us one thing left, the ordinance relative to large-scale ground-mounted solar arrays. I have this on here as a status report because that's what was requested by the commission. Um, but I understand it might be more than that. If, um, uh, Bill, do you mind if I toss this your way? Or? Sure, and then Lisa will 
back me up. Uh, leg it came before legislative matters. You've had actually Alisa opened up the first hearing. The hearing has been continued. It went. It, we had another one uh, earlier this week, and then it's continued still. And, uh, and in fact, actually, much of it's been reconciled. Uh, there's an issue about what's the trigger lot size. Uh, um, I should probably catch everyone up. Uh, the, I'm sorry. The uh, the concern is right now that. Um, Large-scale solar arrays are now seeking out uh, development in forested land. Uh, normally, they favor cheaper, easier to develop agricultural land, but most of Northampton's land is in protection and, and, and doesn't afford itself for larger arrays. The uh, currently, uh, Carolyn, poor Carolyn has been working on this for quite a while trying to adjust. There's some, uh, she's cleared it with the solicitor finally at this point, I think, but the, uh, one of the concerns now is the lot size that would trigger um, the requirements, which include, although not without much specificity because it seems complicated, but a, a habitat analysis, a uh, carbon sequestration comparison, essentially, uh, to determine, you know, solar's uh, reduction in fossil fuel consumptions, carbon issues related to the carbon storage systems in all the trees. Uh, the definitions have been cleared up a little bit as opposed to saying older trees, over 100, now we're talking about larger trees, talking about their ability to, to process uh, carbon and store it. Um, Anyway, so the, I think the crux of the, the biggest challenges right now, uh, the, uh, I believe, while well, Lily Lombard, as a citizen, wasn't representing necessarily the committee when she suggested that, but the preference was to start at an acre. Anything that required, any system that's larger than an acre would trigger the, all the uh, requirements that are being listed now. Um, the planning board's proposal is three acres. And in both cases, the arguments are that there are arbitrary choices, although the DOER uh, uh, defines a medium or precise array starting at an acre or larger. Am I getting all this right? I'm surprised I could retain all this. But the, uh, um, but the three acre decision was there's a trigger point of 25,000 board, 25, board feet. So roughly 25,000 board feet. Um, if you want to clear 25, 000, more than 25,000 worth of board feet, uh, you need to uh, uh, apply for a forest plan. I mean, a uh, forestry plan. Roughly, that's three acres. Although that's, it's a bit, there was some debate about that. But that, and I believe that was Carolyn's uh, reasoning about why she chose three acres over um, over the one acre. Well, there was also the legal issue of, or Alan brought up the issue that um, if you're clearing woods for a home to build a right. home, you can build what is it, an acre and a half without uh, a acre, permit. Yeah. So this would actually incentivize people to build private homes on an acre as opposed to thinking about putting up something useful like solar. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Quite complex and complicated. And confidence to it as well? Yeah. Please. So part of this is also the debate of, you know, if you're getting solar, where is it going? So Ag Commission and now our zoning is trying not to get PV and prime ag land. Um, <clears throat> and so, of course, it's this tension. The more we don't allow the meadows anyway. But outside the meadows, we do allow it. And so the more we have strict rules about trees, the more we're losing prime ag land. When Sincarpio got the permits for um, clearing trees on, on uh, Park Hill Road, that came out to just under 25,000 board feet, and that was about three acres. So obviously it depends on how you have huge white pines close together, you might have smaller acres, but Sincarpio is where Carolyn got the three acres. Right. right. Um, 
the other thing is we have sort of a weakness right now. So, for, so you need a permit from the state to clear over hundred uh, over twenty five thousand board feet, unless you have a development permit. Um, for Con Ed, what they did is they said, well, we, we don't have a development permit because they couldn't get one that's over twenty five thousand board feet. Um, we're going to cut down all the trees. We're not going to get a forest cutting permit, right. which I would think makes them technically a violation of state law, but the state isn't doing any enforcement. So they found what's technically not a loophole because it's a violation of state law, but what's practically a loophole because the state's but not that was clear that's a look back clause. Right, in this language, but, but that includes those there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the other issue of going for less than three acres is the whole point of this ordinance was to expand somewhat where PD is right. allowed. Going to one acre or so two acres is actually more restrictive than we are. Right. What incentivized this was the 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 loophole that Wayne described. That that right now someone who would not be so scrutable would, would be um, could just go and clear this these acres out already without a buy your weed pretty much, and then come and apply for the permits on a on a on a strip lot. As opposed to applying for the lot and then getting and running into all these <coughs> requirements by the city, which didn't exist actually. There were no requirements, there were no limitations or requirements. So, there, in some sense, there's, there's some urgency in that in the absence of law. Also, it should worth noting is the state has been absolutely no help whatsoever. And the state, once again, is the same thing with how do we tax them uh, solar arrays, <laughs> large scale. Industrial solar arrays, privately held. Um, we've had to make up and negotiate payment lieu of taxes programs because the state hasn't been able to define, and, and a number of other communities have already been sued and lost when they try to apply standard taxation to them. So, this is us. Just make sure I understand that so the point is under both taxation authority and zoning authority. The state exempts exempts PV. Right. We believe the intention was to exempt ground mounted exactly. parking lots and rooftops, and that's what we think for both taxes and zoning. But that's not what the statute says. The statute says they're exempt because the statute was invented 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And they they have met, they didn't even consider large scale solar arrays, and they haven't caught up to it at all. And the reason it's come back here for more than a report potentially is that um, where it is since we met last month is that um, the, the proposed ordinance was rewritten. The Public Shade Tree Committee pulled itself out as a sponsor because it didn't like the language. It went back after negotiations between Public Shade Tree Committee folks and Carolyn Mish, um, there, it was rewritten. Um, it went to the planning board. The planning board passed it without a whole lot of conversation. Um, and then the Public Shade Tree Commission Committee said that um, it was still problematic. Came to the legislative matters here and the other day on Monday, last Monday, and um, this past Monday, and asked essentially for us to continue it again so that they could have yet another conversation with the planning department um to to shift the things that bill's talking about so some of the other things that i just want to mention that were um kind of sticking points was a request for further now a way of doing analysis of the equivalencies between the role of trees and solar panels and what how what roles they play in carbon neutrality um more comp uh, more comprehensive analysis of the roles the role that trees and forests play in car not just carbon sequestration, but um, animal life, the breeding grounds of animals, um, all of the benefits that the animals that utilize forests bring to the picture. Um, there's a, there was a request for follow-up on the notion that stumps left in the ground, which is provided for in the current iteration of this uh, proposed legislation. Um, that they, that they still sequester carbon when they're just tree stumps. You can elucidate something about this, Rich. Um, there are folks saying that that's actually not true, that once they begin to rot, they release all of their carbon, and so that's not adequate to say, you know, you can cut down as much as you want and you can leave the stumps in and it still provides that carbon sequestration. There was a question about decommissioning and reclamation of the sites. These are 
technologies that in 20 years are going to look really different. They might be much smaller and provide the same benefit. So we're going to have these, you know, we're going to cut down potentially three acres of forest, put up big, um, you know, behemoths that are going to be uh, irrelevant in 20 years. So what's going to happen in terms of returning the sites to their natural habitat when the lifespan of the, the solar panels goes away? Um, and there's still a question, I think, that wasn't answered about the transmission lines. And Carolyn um, spoke at the meeting about how current zoning takes care of those questions. But I think there's still some question about the transmission lines from the panels and how it will disrupt um, the forested areas around where the panels are placed. So it, we did continue this hearing, the Legislative Matters Committee. It has been passed already by the Planning Board. But uh, the Public Shade Tree Committee and some other folks really want to kind of look at it again and ask that the Energy and Sustainability Commission also think about these questions, weigh in, and see if we have any language, any suggestions about how it can be tweaked. So that's, I think, why you know it's come back here. Okay. And actually, I haven't been given notice that it had come back here. Um, so. Um, I don't think there's been a formal question. There hasn't. I mean, that's the problem. It was that, and this is an oversight. It should have been referred to this committee uh, initially on the council, and it wasn't. So it's not on you. Yeah. This is us yeah. pleading for some input. I mean, Elisa summed it up perfectly. In the, and then some of the, you know, the issues, as I said, were the, thr the thrust of the issue, at least for me, is, is cost benefit um, relative to. Uh, and it's hard because as I was t saying to Adele, we're not comparing apples and oranges. We're car comparing apples and screwdrivers. They're not. They're not even the same phylum. They're not even. I mean, there's so many things. There's so many variables. And of course, what drives a PV array is is this is a profitable business as opposed to a maintaining a, a static forest doesn't uh, make someone money. And so that the you know there's a large incentive from uh, someone developing a large-scale PV array, there's our required stewardship of taking care of land in, the, in that competitive interest. And how do we do it so it's fair, it allows for what is, the state has incentivized development of solar, which we're all for in, in many respects for the, for the reasons that we've stated, but there are, there are impacts and consequences that are of, of paramount concern and we want to do this right or as right as we can. How many uh, development projects are, are like There's this? two currently, right? Wayne, they there's two a couple permitted, of two they both close to the land, they're going forward, so they're they're going to be under construction the next month. Is the tax revenue really good on those? I mean, so they negotiated payment of low taxes, they've been good arrangements for all, so we have three, one of the landfills is a little bit different because we own the property, and then these other two. The state program is less generous, so we're not getting as much as some of the leaders in the state are getting because you're just, you know, just less profit. But yes, they're good returns. They're negotiated returns. But they're pilots. They're right. paying the taxes, not taxes. They're 20 years of yeah. right. The solar people want the pilots because they want to perform it. Even though they're paying more than legally they have to pay today, they will be protected when eventually the legislature allows us to tax solar panels. And we want it because we don't know what the legislature is going to do. Yes. <laughs> so we're both interested in sort of figuring this out. But Susan Wright's lead that, led that. She's been looking at what other communities are charging and feels like we're getting fair returns. So right now it's just the tree committee really conducting this conversation at this point with the planning department, Carolyn Mish. Um, it's not going to go back to the planning board because they've made their decisions. So this is our moment as a commission to jump in, weigh in, create language before we it. Otherwise, it's really just the tree committee. And they have a particular you know, view on this, of course. Um, but we are the people that purportedly have the knowledge around you know, what the benefits of you know, solar panels versus trees can be, should be. I'm really interested in those studies of uh, the, the carbon sequestration versus the renewable energy question of is it even close? And sometimes the renewables are just so much more valuable. Depends on who, who you listen to. And it's really 
I mean, I'm amazed at how how disparate the numbers are, and, and so who can you believe? I mean, it's you know, I came to the conclusion that I couldn't figure it out, or that I couldn't decide based on what I could, what information I could get off the internet. And this is why um, the tree committee has asked for a slowdown of the process because there hasn't been enough time to really look at the research and really kind of, you know pull out the numbers and try and figure things like that out. One of the things that a lot of people stress that I think is something to really think about is that, you know, if we're looking at a 20-year lifespan for a solar array, but you've cut down, you know, 100-year-old trees, um, it's going to take a really long time when that, plant, that, that array is decommissioned for those trees to grow again. So you've gotten 20 years of, 20 years of you know, non-fossil fuel energy out of it, carbon neutrality out of having solar panels, but then you've destroyed the, you know, the natural habitat and everything that provides um, for, you know, another right. yeah, look at just, decades. Look at just the greenhouse gases, and even then, regarding the habitat, just yeah. the greenhouse gases, what's the balance? I could add sort of two points about that. Okay. One, of course, it is, it may well be the panels themselves are decommissioned in 20 years, but likely the rest of the infrastructure is going to be there. So you might swap out panels, but still have the framework and the power line. So it's likely to be here. And the other thing is, for the most part, not always, but they're probably, they're often sites which are otherwise going to be developed. Right? Because we you know the city, frankly, is buying up. We're the biggest bot land buyer in the city. In the, in the, within the boundaries of the city, where the Hampton buys more than anything else. And so it's mostly the land which we're not getting, which is getting. Well, part of the, part of the appeal of a lot of these lots is that they're difficult to develop without frontage, and some of the appeal, of course, is that and, and development. With part of the appeal is the land's cheaper um, and has the right exposure. And so it's a lot of the same zoning. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think that your point about the age of the forest is really important. Uh, the value, as far as sequestration of old forest, is very different than new forest. I. Uh, and so if you if you put an age limit on the forest or a growth stage limit on the on the deforestation that might be an interesting way to approach it uh, the other thing that will have an effect is is what is the end use of all of that board footage if it's going to be burned that's very different than if it's going to be milled if it's going to be milled then you're still sequestering all of that carbon uh, in that lumber that will last for a hundred years, hopefully. Whereas if you, you're burning it, then you immediately release all of that CO2 right back into the atmosphere and you've done a significantly greater amount of damage. Well, they, actually, also what we didn't mention was included in this discussion was um, in part of the calculus, estimating the trees that would be removed what their growth would be over a 10, 15 year period and how and what that offset would be too. That would be part of, that would be included. But in most of the cases I would imagine, I'm just guessing, I don't think there's really a lot of valuable timber stock in there. That, that um, so I'm not sure how it would be used. That, you know, everything from wood chips, burning probably not likely, but I don't know, I don't know. And, that, and so this is this is and to Louis's point, actually, the science on this has yet to be exact because it depends. If I mean, I've been talking with Bob Leverett, who who's made his life's uh, mission uh, measuring trees and trying to determine the carbon sequestration, and he was saying that we have not come up with a, a, a precise model yet. There are, and you can get any number of experts who will tell you one thing over another. And if you, if somebody's, uh, if a developer's coming, they're going to find the guy who's going to tell them, give, give you the best numbers. This is what happens to for, for traffic studies and things like that. Um, so we have to figure out somewhere in between because there actually is some aspect of urgency. Going slow is fine, except the fact is we're vulnerable right now. In the absence of any regulations or any laws, we're, we're vulnerable. So we want to make good enough law, not really good law, but I think the point is, is to make good enough law um, that will at least 
get us through a period, this period of transition without any support from the state and without much support from other agencies. We're, we're on our own, but I think it's important that we address this. I think the planning board was absolutely correct to try and move on something like this, to at least have some form of definition in order to uh, offer, afford us some protection where there is none now. It, <coughs> I, I have a lot of concerns about expanding the, the acreage too much. I think there's potential for a lot of regrets. You know, Beyond Carbon Force provides so many other ecosystem services that haven't been raised, you know, in terms of habitat and um, soil structure and integrity and preventing runoff and you know, a million things we can talk about. Um, and then I, I think one of the most important considerations is the fact that this technology is going to be totally integrated at the, at the end of its lifespan. And then we're going to be left with this clear cut piece of land where the infrastructure is not going to be very useful. You know, we're going to be able to create the same amount of energy on it quarter of the space, or in this case, are on the sides of buildings with paint. We're not going to be putting these giant rectangles on the land. Um, so I don't know, if we if we can't mandate, you know, first covering parking lots where you then benefit from shade and rain cover, then is there a way that the city could incentivize those projects happening first? Like, to me, well, that, state, that's a, that's a huge win, covering the parking lots. And that's infrastructure we would like 20 years from now. And, and that, so, that, so that's already built into the state smart program. You get higher incentives if you build over a parking lot. But they're not generous enough to people. Yeah. <coughs> they, how can they don't we sweeten it? How can we sweeten it? Yeah, the cost of building parking lot structures is actually in building the structure itself, not in the yeah. panels. So that's why they're they're not actually viable from a development standpoint. Uh, and that that's really the bottom right. line of but it. But there are a lot of other like unless the city incentivized benefits. incentivized covering part of the cost of the structure. So you know all of that steel is really what stops people from building parking lot covering structure. Yeah, I think it's more complicated than that. I mean, you then have this chance of someone banging into your array. No, it's not. Okay. It's not. I, I've developed a number of them, and we can't make the numbers work. Okay. The other thing that's sort of, you know, the weird irony in this is the trees that we probably all want to protect the most, I mean, obviously the city protecting the land for habitat, that's one thing, but the trees we want to protect the most are the ones that are actually at greatest risk because they're commercially viable trees. The ones that are smaller and less viable, those are the ones that do get shut. I mean, when you look at the uh, Park Hill Road one, you know, they cut down all the trees, but some, and, and the same thing goes for the uh, Bill Willard site, the trees that were really big and really spectacular and really upsetting the neighbors are the ones that I'm sure they sold for timber. Um, and I'm sure they made money selling them. And then the stuff that's left, they chipped and I'm not sure they did the chips. <laughs> so wait, in a way you're saying if, if it wasn't for the PV array possibility, the city's at risk right now of losing its forests anyhow to development, to- Yeah, for any reason, I mean, Parker Road's a good example. We made a bid on the property 10 years ago. We got turned down because it wasn't high enough. They, they thought you know they thought it was higher. They didn't find someone who saw this piece, but they clearly we've been looking at the property for a long time, and they were looking at it for a long time. Bill Willard would happen a little bit faster. I'm not sure what would happen to Bill Willard. I mean, Parker Road could have been homes. They would have had to spend a lot of money to extend the road, but it could have been homes. Bill Willard would be more of a unique case because it was so far back. I'm not sure what it would have been used for other ones. Marijuana. Uh, marijuana, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> like the other thing is marijuana. Exactly. <laughs> that sequesters a lot of carbon, though. <laughs> so there's our rug. I think, our, said that, but I, think, I think the consensus is getting close for the things over whatever the acreage is. It seems like right. the biggest disagreement, I mean, there's some tinkering, but it seems like the biggest disagreement is what's allowed by right before you do this full analysis. Exactly. Well, the problem with too small of a lot, too, is that if it's actually in the forest, you're going to have shading from all sides. You know, so if if you only if you cut down an acre in the woods, then then a third of it is not useful. If you for a site panels. that's all wooded, it doesn't matter what the exemption is. In order to get big enough to get to the threshold people want, they're going to have to cut down over three acres. So that that number doesn't matter. It's more things like Park Hill Road. Where the site was I'm not sure ten acres. I'm making it up, and there were three acres of trees. So that you know, it's the site that's generally open to use some trees. That's where that threshold is going to matter. 
if you really do five megawatts, or whatever that the magic number is, and it's all forested, you're going to be hitting the bigger threshold. Yeah, yeah and, and less likely. I mean, th these are not being discussed, at least now, being dropped in the middle of a dark forest. Right, so, yeah. That makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> in a sense, I mean, <clears throat> Well, I was going to ask, how does how does the commission how can the commission help? At the moment, well, I, I think you know, speaking to you know, as Lisa said, so far we've heard what the Shade Tree Commission is saying. We're talking about the, the efficacy and trade-offs for larger solar arrays, uh, privately held solar arrays, opposed to uh, municipally managed ones. And you know, what do we lose? What do we gain from from that perspective. So, so timing-wise, I doubt anybody on the commission is able to answer that question. Right. I, I, I knew <laughs> as much. Yeah, I know. There's, there's some bigger concepts that I mean, we, we yeah. stand on that we've already talked about a lot. Like if exactly. we're trying to make a, a zero energy building code or green our our, our uh, utility infrastructure, we need to do it somewhere. Yeah. Right. So, well, know, this is the are, are these projects helping our grid? Become more than 15% renewable. I mean, is this energy going right into the grid? Just how we're going to do it is by these distributed private developments that are putting energy into the grid. But in, in a perfect world without any tree removal, I think the answer would be obvious. Yeah. But then again, you know, what Ashley's talking about is, and and also the long-term loss of uh, sequestration. Yeah. Is there a is there a net loss in this? Are we going? Are we stepping backwards? It's not getting it. We're, we're, if we're trying to make so many strides in terms of right. our utility infrastructure, our grid, and being renewable and sustainable, it has to come from somewhere. Yeah, I mean, and it's going to change our landscape. It's going to change what we call nature. How we use energy is going to be different. How we make energy is going to be different. Um, some people think solar panels on all roofs is a terrible idea because of right. historic reasons or aesthetics. But you know, we, we have to take those kinds of strides. So at some point, you know, forests need to be cut. You know, I'm just I'm just kind of talking about the strictly, you know, sustainable energy future. There's going to be it's going to impact our landscape, and I mean, or, or maybe there's another way to do it. Maybe it doesn't have to, and I, I don't know. Like, are these developments really helpful, or are they just getting some developer wealthy? Well, I we, well, I, I, I wouldn't discount either possibility, but I think that we don't know, and, and that I mean. You know, you look at California, which now mandates all new structures have to have solar panels on them. Well, now they're having major issues because of butters with trees. Who loses? They have to cut their trees because they're blocking the solar panels. At, at, Is that true? Access light no. some, in some communities. Yeah, we have, in California, it's a specific solar access law yeah. that we don't have. Wow, it's a little bit different. That's and, uh, you know, plus historically, the uh, you know the formerly denuded all of New England uh, that had absolutely no trees at once upon a time, and our, most of our forests are our second or third world forests. Um, so, you know, legacy trees. There are not a lot of them, but the fact is, is carbon sequestration systems now are are much better. So, so that you, in the absence of unfortunately of clear. Um, provable peer-reviewed data of compa making comparisons. This is where, this is the position that we're stuck in. And it's an interesting problem, and if for nothing else rather than this academic conversation, because as we, because Elisa's job and my job is to actually, we have to develop law in the absence of this information. We, so we have to play some Solomon's game because the impetus for the law is the fact that in the absence of a law, Bad things happen. You can't just write an up, updated Lorax book and right. oh, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> more complicated. <laughs> I think the conversation that we're having here is kind of this microcosmic experience of what the issues at hand are and what the tensions are. And if we as a commission can't kind of come to a place of agreement, I'm not sure that we're going to be much use in the process that's happening, which is the Public Shade Tree Commission, or at least Lily and Todd Ford, who's the, chair, the vice chair, um, are talking to the planning department. So 
if we feel like we can't come to some kind of consensus here with this group, I'm not sure how we can weigh in, short of you know you representing the commission and just kind of doing it by the seat of your pants, Chris. But yeah. what are we going to ask the consent about? Right, that's that's it. I haven't heard exactly. I mean, I've heard a lot of walking around. Well, it, actually, but well, you know what? Even the absence of, of clear answers is is an answer. It's not. <laughs> I mean, you don't. I mean, that actually. I mean. I was hopeful that maybe someone would come up and say, "Oh no, wait a minute! Here, the, these you know these are peer-reviewed studies that have come over blah 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 over over a period of time, and this is where the offsets are." Yeah, and see, no, this is are. what the, the the tree committee is saying is that that stuff does exist to a large extent. We just haven't taken the time to really look at it. And you guys might disagree with that and say that you know they're finding the particular ones that support their position, but. But there is a question here. Have we taken the time to really look in a very in-depth way at the research that's necessary to make the right decision? And that's why the tree committee was trying to slow it down. Well, yeah. and, and the energy commission hasn't had a chance, wouldn't have, wouldn't have had a chance to, to look at those either to right. try to find that. So timing-wise, how much time, you know, what is the time frame? If you need answers tonight, we're not going to get no, no, no. them. If you need answers by next month, you know, we can put it on our agenda for next month. So the continuation of the hearing is till the next Legislative Matters Committee meeting, this which is, is May. April 13th, no, no, May 13th, May 13th, something like that. Sounds like it's right before our meeting. So or? it's by then that if the ordinance is going to be tweaked, it will need to be tweaked to come back to us for consideration, unless we would work to continue it again, which you know, could happen, I suppose. It's not a wrong possibility. But I think it's worth a conversation um, between you and Carolyn and maybe Lily Lombard, maybe Rich as the tree warden to kind of just figure out if we want to take some kind of position. I mean, I think one of the biggest questions, as Bill said, is can we lower it to one acre, go from the three acres to one acre? And I believe right now that's where the tree committee is kind of uh, standing that would like it lower to one acre. Um, but then there's that list that I shared of other questions about, you know, what kind of decommissioning stuff would be in place, um, you know, how do we, have we looked enough at the research around carbon sequestration? Is this something you sent out just recently? I didn't see that. No, no, no she, okay. Just, okay. she just iterated one when, when she was speaking. Okay, okay, okay. I have a, I have a general question. Can the city require at a certain point, and I'm not even sure this even gets to your question, can the city require, instead of saying it's a yes or no based on a certain size, age, of trees, or whatever, can the city require someone to produce a study? That's what it's got. And it's built in. So, so that's what the threshold is about. So if it's above whatever it is, one acre, two acres, three acres, you need to do a study. If it's below that, then it's by right. And then not only just a study, can, who can, this, can the city require um, basically a plan? You know, city you require points want. on how the wood going to be used. Well, there is a recycling. Yeah, recycling. Yeah, city can require any sort of filing pieces. It has two pieces, two limits. One is just the practical one that this is a business you can make money on, but the margins are tight enough that if you ask too much, they're just going to go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So they go to West Hampton or wherever they go. So practically, you just wouldn't get a response to it. And then the second thing is based on Allen's interpretation. Allen's what the city solicitor's interpretation of this gray area, are these allowed by right or not? He wants a clear, measurable standard um, that maybe creates less discretion than a typical special permit. So often the city can require lots of stuff. We're careful not scaring away the things or things we want. But um, yeah. the, re the reason I'm bringing it up because you know, as you talk about it, obviously what what impact it's going to have on CO2, it depends on a whole bunch of features, and, and including what's what it's going to be used for. <coughs> That's a, that's, a, that's a big piece of it. Um, what might the land be used for otherwise? Um, you know, if it's out there and there's no access, it's not going to be developed. Well, then there's no development pressure on it. That changes the picture. But if they're going to just clear the land and burn it all, that's a different response than if they're going to clear the land and it's going to go into building houses. Um, right, but I'm not sure you can get definitive answers to that because, you know, the kitty guys aren't going to do the land otherwise, but you don't know who else might come forward in the process. Yeah, but you, so, you, so you, couldn't require, you couldn't require them to come up with a sustainable wood management plan for the cleared wood, something like that. You know, you can, okay, you can clear the wood, but you have to give us a plan and you have to show us how it's going to be sustainable. So that's 
so that you know you're not going to just get rid of the stuff. You're still out how it was being used. And yes, we could do that, but I'm not, I think a developer doing that would say, hey, I can just do a forest cutting plan with state approval today and get rid of two thirds of the wood. And yeah, then so they will go around. There. There. They think it's still go around. Right. Okay, right. So we have. Um, right, for our job, we have no like developer, what are the loopholes? Yeah, we, we have no chance. chance. Yeah. Well, Alicia, I'd be happy to meet with folks um, uh, and, you know, join in the conversation um, from, my, from my own point of view. I assume we would want it on the, energy, on the commission's agenda. Well, maybe we decide before the next commission's meeting whether it's on the agenda. Does it come back to it? Well, it's essentially going to be too late because that meeting will be after we have the next legislative right. matters. Mm -hmm. No, you said the next legislative matters is on the hearing. No, it's the May 13th. May 13th. So the Energy Commission is going to meet before that. Um, it, it'll it's meet on the 9th. Week. It meets on the 9th. Right. The 13th. Is, on May 15th. Then. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to double work. check here. Whatever the second Monday is, is when we meet. The I don't know. It's the way it falls. We meet on the second Thursday, and that's the night. And the second Monday is the 13th. Yeah. 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 It's a quirk of the calendar. I mean, it's at Thursday's eyes. Usually it's a quirk. It's a back in time. Three pages. Three pages. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's right. All right. So, you all so we could, there would be a chance to bring it back to the commission. Um, I mean, that would be helpful. I think, uh, I think. Right. Regard, as I said, even the absence of an answer is helpful. At least mm -hmm. it helps us figure out what's the best way to proceed. Okay. Um, and then in that case, I guess you know what I can do by meeting is try to provide the commissioners with information so that we all aren't walking in here, you know, just having talked about something totally different, and you say, "What? <laughs> I have to think about this." <laughs> yeah. so it's not things, the kind of thing that's right on the tip of your tongue all the time. Two know? things that I feel like need to be brought to the table other than the ones that are, and I can share any of that with you, Chris, is just the habitat analysis, what the threshold is for any kind of analysis and report around um, habitat, but also the climate resiliency um, kind of aspects, thinking a little more creatively, I think, about what, what it means to have old growth or, or large trees um, and less than large trees cut down in terms of climate resiliency and, and uh, you know erosion and animal habitat breeding ground what are the other things that you were talking about in terms of um, forest systems water retention the uh, erosion, erosion prevention the, we're creating permeable surfaces with uh, because I think those are the kinds of things that we haven't really focused in on. And Adele, I'm wondering if you have other, because you've been part of the group that's kind of been talking about this, other concerns that haven't been really looked at. I think we've pretty much covered them. Um, I'm not part of the, the tree committee. No, I know that, but the, just you've been part of the kind of group of folks who've been asking these questions. But I'll send you an email that just has these things kind of outlined. Okay. Well, the other thing um, that you, you touched on is, um, you know, when you cut down trees to put up solar arrays, and the solar array may have a 20-year lifespan, it may, may have a 30-year, who knows? Um, but the trees are gone, pretty much. And the trees, otherwise, would have maybe lived 50 years, 100 years. And so if you're going to factor in that into the equation, um, it really changes the balance of carbon sequestration, um, the benefits of solar versus trees, because the trees continue to sequester carbon. Unless, of course, the trees might be developed. In that case, there is no uh, guarantee right. that they right. live at all. Yeah. Uh, one more thing to throw into the equation is to make sure that the embodied energy of the manufacturer of the steel frames and the poles and the installation and the panels themselves is included in the analysis. Mm -hmm. And that's related to the decommissioning as well, I think, because what will it take to actually dismantle at some point? You know, how, how deep are you digging to create the footing and just all the ways in which that creates environmental destruction and uh, the decommissioning of those things, you know, just takes an enormous amount of energy. Well, that's pretty much, I mean, that, that's pretty relatively known. Um, 
uh, they've looked at the, you know, the energy payback of PV systems. And I know for rooftop systems, they're a year, less than a year, the energy payback at this point. Mm -hmm. not, not quite that good? No. Two, two years? Uh, oh, seven. Seven. No, seven. 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 The last yeah. numbers I heard were around that. Well, you're, you're um, but that, that's that, financial payback. You're talking about life No, right. I'm talking about, I'm talking about talking CO2 about payback. payback. Oh, energy that payback. Energy payback. How, that how long does it take to, to make the energy it takes to build, make the panels? I think it's about yeah, a year or two. Yeah, that I don't. Yeah, so that's pretty pretty rapid. When you add in steel, you know, girders and stuff, it goes up, I'm sure. Um, you know, it takes longer. But, um, but that's pretty well known industry-wide, and people expect it except the fact that you're going to get more, a lot more energy out of the system than it's going to take to build the system. In that equation, when you put in the cost of not having solar, like getting our energy from dirty? No, this is basically just how much, how long will it take to get the energy out that it takes to build the, the array. So, you know, it's going to take a certain amount of energy to build it. I don't know what, how, what kind of energy you're going to use, but how long does it take to get that energy back out? And it takes, so rooftop arrays, I think it's around a year, between, somewhere between 0.7 and a year and a half, something like that. Uh, I, takes to get back. I would also say that I, I wouldn't expect the lifespan of these projects to only last 20 years. So panels only degrade by 20% after 20 years, approximately. Well, the, so the, concern was less the, less. The, the concern was less so much of the panels. Uh, Degrading, it was more about the technology surpassing it. Well, the, the, it's it's trade-off efficacy when you when it's likely there will be systems that uh, at least might surpass it and they would become moot. That's and, possible, but the so much of the like the cost and the challenge of building solar installations is the interconnection and, and linking the system to the grid as well as just the land land preparation and building a structure so once the structures are in place and the connection to the grid is there uh, the actual panel a uh, panel replacement 20 years down the line would be cost almost nothing in comparison to how much it would generate and if the panels are so much better in 20 years then the paybacks will be there for anyone who owns the solar array to simply slap new panels on the existing structure, it will cost them almost nothing. They'll get that incredible output boost. Uh, I would expect those to be there for 100 years. Uh, there's no reason that they won't continue to make panels that fit these structures that are already in place and linked into the grid. The grid is going to go through a lot of changes. Um, but I think that most of that's going to have to do with it becoming a two-way stream of energy and adding in a lot of storage mm -hmm. capacity into it to allow for uh, load smoothing. Um, and so I wouldn't count on the, I, I would expect that these things will stay there for far beyond any of our lifetimes. I think there's, there's significantly large solar arrays in Arizona and California that have been there um, 45 or 50 years now. Yeah. And, and they're, they haven't, they haven't moved them. They've simply changed the whatever generating mechanism that there's been. Um, right. And the cells themselves, I mean, some of the first cells ever developed are probably still developing, still providing power. So the cells themselves don't go bad. I would say the only other thing I would have to put in just as a, a city resident is that where these installations are allowed to go matters to me. I mean, the, I don't see why they would be allowed to be built in residential areas where they're just slashing down the forest. I, I don't they think they argue the other way. That, that yeah, what, don't get out in the woods and chop down a bunch of trees. Use some areas that are closer in absolutely. That, aren't, that aren't, you know, particularly um, attractive or yeah. useful. Yeah, put them in an ugly commercial area and what's that lot doing down on King Street next to the old car dealership? How many acres is that? Uh, you know, yeah, the, uh, just as an example, the thing is hideous. That's that's also one of the most expensive real estate lots. <laughs> yeah, sure. City, so, and, and believe me, the issues associated with that lot did give me keep me up at. <laughs> 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 I've got a lease. 
this has been one of the most fascinating discussions I've had a chance to listen in on the teams I've been in this room. Y'all are just this huge, huge mission by the tail. And everything is saying the information is muddy at best. Yes. And there are huge issues of public policy. And in the time frame we're talking about, we're going to have massive coastal population displacements going on already. And that's likely to change the rental market in North Carolina. I circle back around. <laughs> Well, I would take a motion to adjourn. Uh, I'll move the adjourn. All right. Actually, got a second as well. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.